uh, it's probably not surprising for you that during the time, the amount of data grows almost exponentially. And with the Internet of Things and more and more devices connected to the Internet, we can be pretty sure that this trends will continue and uh, probably in a couple of years the amount of uh, data being generated on the internet will again grow uh, exponentially. This is probably not surprising. What is maybe a little bit more interesting is structure of the data. The black part which grows linearly is rough estimation that this part is formed by structured data. But uh, this exponential part is uh, mostly uh, created by semi-structured or, or unstructured data. Uh, there, this has some implication and I will uh, return to this a little bit later. But uh, so uh, I guess this uh, amount of data is really big and this phenomenon is known as a big data. So maybe, uh, but uh, for everyone, it can mean something different. So maybe to be sure that we are on the same page, how big the data has to be to call it big data. So do you have some definitions or how big the data have to be to call it big data? That? <laughs> so some more tips. I have scarf. I have half full bottle of coffee if you don't want scarves or banana. So. Terabytes, okay, terabytes, Some, something, somebody else? One no? Megabyte. One megabyte? Okay. So some definitions, okay, so uh, probably the most uh, popular and commonly used definition is this one, that big data is anything which crash or excel. <laughs> uh, uh, it's kind of joke, but uh, that we can take some, something from this, and that is that, uh, uh, basically, you can buy more beefy machine, you can buy uh, a recent version of Excel which support more throws, but with this exponential growth, sooner or later you will probably, uh, the scaling up won't be sufficient and you will probably have to scale out. And this scale out uh, uh, and uh, scalability issue is uh, not always just uh, because of amount of data, but also because of cost efficiency. For example, imagine you run a uh, shop on the internet and before the Christmas you probably have to deal with really a huge amount of data while uh, during the summer when everybody is on, on the holidays, uh, the amount of orders will be probably significantly slower. So uh, there's no point to buy some really beefy big machine just before uh, two weeks be uh, before the Christmas and the rest of the year have this beefy, beefy machine. So there are two main reasons, just amount of data and not only this, but uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, and. Uh, uh, some other challenges of big data. This is not uh, completely, there are a couple of challenges which I will try to address later in this talk. So if you have a huge amount of data, of course, uh, running an analysis on top of that is challenging just because of a huge amount of data. Uh, you have to also store somewhere the data. And as I mentioned in the first slide, uh, quite a lot of data can be unstructured. Uh, so you have uh, to have some solution which is able to store uh, the unstructured data or not process data which are not processed. Again, there can be other reasons like that uh, you, the data have some structure but you are not able to process them and just for performance reason you store it as they come and process them later. And when you run some analysis on top of that, you probably will get some data which has some better structure and which you will probably want to later on uh, run some queries on top of them. So you probably also need some solution which is able to store some structured data and run some queries on top of that. So quite often you need both store unstructured data and as well as structured data. The solution, as I mentioned, has to be scalable 
and uh, the scalability is usually done in the cloud. But uh, running application in the cloud uh, gives uh, some more challenges because it uh, completely changes the architecture of the application. In the cloud, everything is ephemeral. So application have to deal with the fact that uh, some piece of hardware will die and uh, application will have to live with that. So uh, can't rely that I will store the data here and uh, two days later the data will be there. So it changes uh, also the approaches how we uh, create the application. So probably the uh, most widely used approaches how to address uh, this kind of challenges is data replication and then uh, running some map reduce on top of the uh, top of this data. And probably the most popular solution is Hadoop. So. So far, so good, I would say. I, I just recap some probably well-known facts, which you probably know. So uh, uh, are there any Hadoop users or who run or, or at least play with that? So are you happy with Hadoop or some, something cool? So it seems everything is OK. So why no, Hadoop is not good enough? Some there was, so. What, what doesn't make you that you are not completely satisfied with Hadoop? Nobody? So, well, you know, people today are more and more uh, unpatient and want their answers uh, immediately. You know, nobody sends letters, everybody sends email, or some people, people even make phone calls and want to have some communication in real time. So, for some people, it's slow because uh, you store some data in Hadoop FS and for example, once a day, some, run some analysis on top of that and some people may, and with the analysis take pretty long time, so some people seems uh, want to do it faster. So how we can speed the whole process up? So uh, one, uh, a really little powerful idea is, especially for algorithms which are iterative, uh, don't store the data to Hadoop FS or to some permanent storage. During the computation, keep the data in memory all the time. And as I said, you remember that you run it in, in a cloud. So it has some implication. You are replicating the data you run some transformation on top of the data, and if you store it, it will also get replicated. And again, it takes time. So uh, maybe stop and think a little bit, do I have to replicate every single change? And the answer would be probably no. Maybe I can run some bunch of operation and then replicate uh, the result set. So it's easy to say, maybe a little bit more hard to do, but fortunately, there are some frameworks which already does that. And probably the most popular one is Apache Spark. In the heart of Apache Spark is a concept which is called resilient distributed data sets. And uh, the shortcut is RDD. It's basically immutable distributed collection of data. Immutable, it means that if you run some change on top of that, it doesn't change this RDD, but it creates new RDD. And there are basically two kinds of operation you can run on top of the RDD. It's transformation, and the transformation takes one or more RDDs and create new RDDs from it. Typical example is map operation or filter operation. Um, a second kind of operation is action. And the actions, it takes some action, as the name suggests, on the RDDs. For example, count how many items are in a given RDD or take the first element and so on. And now the important thing is that RDDs get evaluated lazily. So that you applying change of transformation and it does nothing. It runs in millisecond because it just logs the operation you want to do and the RDDs gets evaluated only when you call action on top of that. So there is really huge 
uh, space for optimization. Imagine that you run, for example, five transformations, or uh, last one is filtering, and the action is called uh, the action is calling first element that you want. Uh, you want to run some transformation and are interested only first element. So, in let's say classical approach, you would run uh, first transformation of a whole bunch of data, save it somewhere, second, third, and then you pick just first element. So, basically, obviously, if you know what you want to do, there is pretty uh, big. Uh, space for optimization so that you run the transformation and why once you filtered uh, first element which matches the last filter you just return it and can stop uh, and that's not all uh, also as for replication you don't have to replicate whole data you just replicate this uh, sequence of actions it's called lineage and when some uh, partition of the data is lost, what you do, you take uh, original data or uh, some RDDs which, which was stored in previous time and recompute the data. So basically you don't replicate every single change and the only thing you replicate is lineage and when some crash happens, the data are recomputed. And it's again safe, it shows that this uh, saves quite a lot of time. And not only that, the RDDs are kept in the memory if possible, uh, so it brings really huge speed up. This is the original paper about RDD. It's quite interesting read, so I recommend it to take a look on uh, it. So uh, this is plot from Spark web page, and it's comparison to run some machine learning algorithm for classification on top of the Hadoop and top of the Spark. As, as you can see, uh, the speed up is two orders of magnitude. So it's a really huge speed up. I'm not saying that for every application you have, the speed up will be two orders of magnitude. Uh, papers report that usually the speed up is one order of magnitude, and for iterative algorithms, it can be two orders of magnitude. But again, it's really nice speed up. So I think this is quite impressive and really worth to think if your application can be pushed to the spark and you can take benefit from it. So, so it sounds good, but can we do even better? At least for, I believe, at least for some application, yes. Let's try to do the processing of the data once it arrives. Maybe it's quite trivial a suggestion, but if I ask how many applications really do that, I would believe that not so much or not so many. <coughs> and maybe it sounds trivial, but the impl implementation could be a little bit tricky. But again, fortunately, somebody already did that. And uh, for example, Spark provide streaming, support for streaming. And uh, uh, as the data comes, it creates from uh, incoming data RDDs and um, put RDDs into micro batches. Uh, it's, uh, and amid this micro batches to Spark work workers, which do the processing. User can uh, 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 here uh, <coughs> configure uh, how frequently the bunch of the or this micro batches should be created. It has some advantages, but also some advantages to, uh, to do this micro batching, but usually works pretty well. So. Uh, if you have some, again, it's immutable, so from, uh, this is, uh, for example, when incoming, you have incoming stream, or, sorry, in Spark terminology, it's called discretized stream or D streams. So here you have, have incoming stream of lines of the text and some micro batches. And imagine you have, you run some, uh, this transformation on top of that, that you split every line into single worlds and uh, create a flat map from it. So what it does, it again creates new D stream and uh, from, uh, applies this transformation to every single batch. And so you will get new stream of uh, 
uh, this micro batches which you can process. So uh, if you rewrite your application to Spark, switch to Spark streaming is pretty trivial. You just do some couple of changing, like changing context to streaming and switch from RDDs to DStreams, but internally these DStreams again contains RDDs, so there's no much, uh, not so much work to switch to streaming and do the processing of the data in real time as the data comes. Uh, if you are uh, not happy with my, yep. Okay, you probably have to, you have to scale scale your uh, solution or, or add more brokers. Yeah, but it's, it's the advantage of running your solution in the cloud. So, for example, if you run it on some Amazon, you just pay for what you really use. So, during the day, you will scale and bring or create a really huge cluster. And during the night, you can skim it, slim it down to one, one node. So, basically, this is a really advantage to run it in a cluster. So, basically... Uh, Application have to be prepared for it, so have to be scalable. And Spark definitely is. There can be some other challenges, like that uh, if you hard code some something here, so you can it can happen that uh, this would wouldn't be enough, and you would like to uh, switch, for example, to one millisecond. So this is one of the uh, disadvantage. So here's. Here's my answer. Maybe you can switch to some uh, real-time streaming processing frameworks. Uh, probably three well, most well-known is Apache Storm, Flink, and Samza. All of three are pretty similar. Originally, I wanted to uh, give some introduction to Apache Storm, but I found that I don't have enough time for it. So fortunately, you, uh, you won't lose the information because it's homework for you. Uh, and once you go home, first thing you should do is to open uh, the web page and uh, read and learn some Hello World example of one of three. All of three of them are pretty similar, so it's fine to read, for example, some Hello World for Apache Storm and to have uh, some feeling how it works. It's not something super complicated, so it shouldn't be a big deal to understand how it works, but it's pretty powerful. Okay, and can we do even better? So, at least in some cases, I believe yes. And what can we do more? Okay, Spark keeps the data in memory during the computation. And, uh, but... Uh, You usually don't store the data, run some uh, Spark analysis on top of that, and then finish and throw the data away. Usually, you have some whole stack of applications, incoming data, for example, some Spark processing, and the result of this analysis is just recent to another application which does something else. For example, it can be uh, some other processing of some already prepared data, and uh, this application send it uh, further to another application, which can be, for example, some business uh, rule processing engine, which can take some automated actions uh, from, on, based on this data, and so on. So there, are, there is usually a whole chain of application, and uh, you have to exchange the data somehow between this application. You usually store it somewhere in Cassandra or uh, uh, some SQL database and so on, but let's try to keep it in memory all the time. So how can you keep the data in memory all the time during uh, processing the whole application stack? The answer is to use some caching. Is that caching is some sketch how cloud works, and you see that caching is a basic principle how cloud works because it's basically just caching. But to be more serious, uh, the answer is to use some in-memory data grid. 
uh, like, for example, InfiniSpan. It's pretty, pretty major uh, in memory data grid solution. I won't come into the details because uh, the, I, first, I don't have time for it. And secondly, I, there was a dedicated presentation about InfiniSpan this morning. So if you miss it, I really recommend you to take a look on the presentation on YouTube. Or if you just want to have some quick review, go to infinispan.org and check some features. I'll, I'll just uh, uh, quickly mention that it's no SQL key value data store, but uh, it's, uh, you can also define some scheme. And if you define some scheme, you can run indexing and queries uh, on top of the InfiniSpan. So uh, this, uh, to some extent, address the challenge which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you have, uh, you sometimes need uh, uh, some solution which is able to store no SQL data, uh, but at the same time able to store s some structured data and run queries on top of that. InfiniSpan could be pretty good solution for this. Of course, it's scalable, elastic, uh, and so on. There is no single of, uh, point of failure, so if some node dies, it, uh, data are replicated and uh, everything works well. One nice thing is it supports transactions. So if uh, uh, you run some, for example, uh, <clears throat> financial application and really needs to be sure that data uh, arrive where it should, it also support trans uh, transactions and have uh, quite a lot of uh, nice features. Uh, I will talk about some of them a little bit later, but uh, most of them, uh, please go to infinispen.org or check the presentation of my colleague Kirka Halusha from this morning. So uh, how we can connect it to Spark and uh, things which I talked uh, before. There's a, a connector for Spark which connects Spark and InfiniSpan. Uh, what does it mean? It means that you can pretty uh, simple uh, just by two lines of config uh, read and write the data from and to InfiniSpan from Spark cluster. So here is just that you define some uh, <coughs> InfiniSpan server uh, address and name of the cache which you would like to process and simply create RDDs or stream from InfiniSpan data. And maybe you can have some different use cases. That, for example, uh, data are coming from Kafka, are processed from Spark, and you just want to push the data for far, uh, processing uh, to InfiniSpan. So you can, of course, write the data. Uh, one nice thing I like to mention is that you can transform RDDs by using InfiniSpan queries. So imagine, for example, that you store some users into the cache and now you uh, are interested in only users which has the same name as I have. So uh, you call the query on users having name equals to Wojtek, and then you filter RDDs just by running uh, InfiniSpan queries on top of, this R of RDDs. And everything happens inside the Spark. So it's pretty nice. Pardon? In the yeah, everything is kept in more memory. In a, pardon? Can you the oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is uh, uh, if everything is kept in memory. So the answer is yes. Actually, in Spark, you can define some storage levels. So actually in Spark, you can keep it also on disk, but what is highly recommended is use storage level memory only. Maybe you can run into some troubles if you use uh, this uh, option because it can Spark can run out of the memory, but uh, it's, yeah. It depends on you. So you can store it also today on disk. But basically, if I remember correctly, uh, 
or you can use another st strategy, memory and disk, so Spark automatically tries to keep the data in memory, and if it's not able to keep it in memory, it st starts storing the data to disk. But uh, uh, you have two solutions. Uh, you can scale up and add more Spark workers, and if it's too costly for you and uh, the, the, you don't have to have the uh, data right now, so you can store it on, on to, the, to the disk and process it later from disk, but it would be a little bit slower, but will you cost less money? So it depends on your use cases and how you evaluate your application. But basically you have both options. You don't have to do any compromises. No, but it's recommended solution. Uh, re recommended solution is to run uh, on every, or uh, you have machine where you run SPAR work worker, and recommended uh, approach is to run on the same machine uh, InfiniSpan ser or one node of the InfiniSpan cluster, because uh, the uh, connector is clever enough and it loads only the data which are stored in this InfiniSpan cache segment which runs on this machine. So basically, yeah, it's not just uh, that InfiniSpan and Spark shares the same memory, it's load over the wire but over, over the local host, so it should be pretty fast. So it's recommended solution to run it on the same mode. It not, not, it's not mandatory, but of course, if you would run it on the different machine, you have, we will have latency on the network, but the recommended solution is to run it on the, on the same machine. But the data will be, will be existing only once, in Yeah. Uh, actually both, because, yeah, no, uh, then... Uh, yeah, for processing, yes. Because, uh, yeah, uh, the question was if the data lives only in InfiniSpan or if I uh, double the data by, uh, if I load it into the Spark. Unfortunately, yes, because these are two different processes which doesn't see uh, the memory of second process. So you have to uh, load, uh, in, so yes, but uh, there's some assumption that uh, not of whole data will be loaded into the Spark. So let's say there is assumption that InfiniSpan will play as more <coughs> permanent storage and you will only uh, load some, uh, let's say, stream part of, of the micro batches into Spark, process it through away and so on. So you don't, don't have to replicate the whole data which are kept in InfiniSpan. Okay, so a couple of uh, other interesting uh, InfiniSpan features which can be uh, used for pushing the data. So imagine that uh, Spark processing in, is done, uh, the, the data arrived, and you would like to push it to other application down the stack. So uh, there is pretty easy solution for that. InfiniSpan has uh, client listeners, so whenever anything changes in InfiniSpan cache, it sends you the notification that uh, something has changed, so you can take immediate action uh, based on it. Some little bit more advanced concept uh, built on top of that is continuous query. Imagine that your user runs some query on uh, the data you get from your analysis, and once, as the data are coming, he wants update. So you have to open, for example, WebSocket and rerun the query again and again. But uh, with continuous query, just re registered the continuous query, and uh, when some data arrive which matches the query, you are notified about the change and can immediately uh, show uh, the change uh, to the end user or some other application and whatever. And if your and another nice feature is uh, implementation of distributed streams. It's basically implementation of Java streams, but over uh, the distributed data. Uh, so if you have uh, some um, uh, application which uh, uh, only do, for example, some map and reduce, you can avoid uh, use Spark and run it directly on InfiniSpan. So in this case, you would completely avoid doubling the data. But m of course, Spark provides much uh, more functionality because it's a dedicated tool for it. But for some more easy or simple use cases, this would be to use only uh, the Spark. So where we do get from the big data? 
We try to keep the data in memory all the time, which should speed up processing of the data and exchanging data between uh, the applications. You process the data as they arrived, and uh, results are pushed to the users by uh, immediately as we have it by, for example, continuous query. So can we call it fast data? Well, I don't know, because DevOps Borup stopped tweeting several years ago, so I have no definition for fast data, but actually I think it doesn't matter how you call it. If it makes you happy to call it fast data, let's call it fast data, but what really matters is if it makes your user happy. And if your users are happy, you will be probably happy too. And I believe that uh, applying these techniques will make your users more happy, and this is what matters. I'm not saying that it's, it's a silver bullet which fits to all use cases, so it's just a couple of thoughts how you can do better, and now it's up to you to think about your application and uh, to do the decision if you can somehow benefit from it. If yes, the tools are ready, so just try to use them. So I have only not, not so much time. So I have some demo. It's really a hello world example, really trivial. I will probably run through the code very quickly because uh, I don't have much time. But uh, the, you can download the presentation and go to my GitHub and the code is there so you can go through the code. It's well, well commented and it's really few lines of code so you shouldn't uh, have the problem to understand it. It basically tries uh, to show you uh, the, or imagine that you have some uh, s network of sensors which measure temperature, send it somewhere to some uh, gateway which uh, stores the measurement into infinite span. Then uh, you want to compute average temperature for every, pl every place and you will you would like to push the result to the user. So basically it does nothing useful, but it's again a hello world example. So as every Hello World example in a cloud, it has unfortunately several components. So the first one is uh, the InfiniSpan server. Uh, it will store all the data incoming and outgoing. Uh, then there will, is one application which simulates this network of sensors. It randomly generates uh, some capital city in Europe and randomly generate the temperature and send it to the InfiniSpan. Then there is Spark for processing the data and computing uh, temperature average for every place. And then there is some client application. If I want to be really in a cloud, I should uh, have InfiniSpan cluster and Spark cluster, but let's skip it for now. Oh, sorry. So I'm starting InfiniSpan server. Uh, my Spark server is already running. So where I... Where do I have it? It's here. So you can see I have one master and one worker on my localhost. Everything runs on my localhost. So, uh, so InfiniSpan is running. So now I will start generating the temperatures. As you can see, it generates some random uh, city and random temperature. I will, oh. I will also start my client. Here I'm passing some arguments to it that I'm interested uh, in temperature only in Prague and Vienna, for example. So I don't have all the changes. So, so now it waits if it gets something. And here I will start Spark streaming. And it will, uh, will listen to infinite span and process the data as they arrive. It prints how many data is in every bunch, uh, bunch of the, the stream. So it's going to generate it uh, around 10 items. So let's take a look. So, and here you can see that I get updates for Vienna Prague as, as they come. So yeah, it's changing. So a little bit Let's take a little bit look on the source code. Here is the client. As I mentioned, it's just simple cache listener for InfiniSpan. So I just, the only thing I need to do is to add this annotation uh, that uh, cache entry data created or cache entry data modified. And that's all. 
and then I can implement my logic, which does only check if the city which uh, is updated is uh, uh, among watch cities, and if yes, it will print something to output. And as for Spark application, it's similar, simple. It just uh, registered uh, to InfiniSpan and create InfiniSpan DStream from it, then does some processing, like extracting the city and uh, the temperature. Then it, uh, uh, as, it's, as I mentioned, uh, in uh, Spark, everything uh, is uh, done in micro-batches. So uh, it can happen that you will get several measurement in, uh, for the same place in one micro -batch. So you group it by the key, and then you just uh, recompute the average with, uh, with some math function. And obviously, as it's stream of the data, so I need to keep somewhere uh, the previous state. So I will keep number of measurement done uh, whole, whole, during the whole period and some of the temperatures and from it compute uh, the average. And uh, I need to keep it somewhere. Fortunately, again, Spark provides nice feature for it. It's called state. So you can run the map, map with state. And it's here. So I'm storing for each city, I'm storing this sum. And what I basically do for uh, every measurement, I update the sum uh, here and update the state. And from this update, I compute the average and return it, which create new stream, uh, new D stream in Spark with averages. And later on, I take this stream of averages and create it back to the infinite span, which store the data and fire my listeners in another application, which will print it to standard output. So that's that simple. Again, I'm sorry, I'm running out of the time, so please uh, check, check uh, my GitHub and you can go through the code if, if you want more. So what to keep in mind, again, try to think if you can uh, do the, uh, if you can keep the data in memory all the time, if you can process data as they arrive, uh, if possible, uh, keep uh, the data in application during the whole memory, uh, processing the whole application stack, and InfiniSpan and Spark provides really nice features which you can use. So these are some thoughts you can think about, and if you have any questions, I prepared some uh, with answers, but if you have some, some other questions, so we have a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what's the structure of the RDD when I have uh, infinite span uh, to, store the, uh, to store the data? There are just uh, keys to the infinite span. So if the, if the RDD is transformed, so it doesn't transform with the data, but just the keys? No, it contains key and value. So pairs of key and values for RDDs and for streams is uh, uh, key value and kind uh, of type of operation, so if the data was removed, updated, or created. So when, with the operation, the, uh, the data are stored, all data for the, for the transformation are stored in the Spark? Actually, for transformation are not stored anywhere. Data are processed only when you take some action off on it, and then are stored in Spark memory, and if you want, you can store it back to the infinite span. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I would like to ask, how is it guaranteed if I have uh, multiple instances of Spark and uh, multiple uh, nodes uh, of uh, InfiniSpan that uh, every single item is processed only once because uh, I have, uh, I have uh, replicas in InfiniSpan. So how is it how guaranteed? It's by primary owner of InfiniSpan. So basically you take only from primary owner it's not av av available, it talks to the replicas, but basically it takes only from primary or owners. Thank you, Wojtek, for a great presentation. Okay, so thank you. If you have other questions, just catch me here in, here in the lobby. Thank you.
Fox. Thomas. Oh, okay. Hey.